This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. It's really a great pleasure to see so many friends and neighbors. Mikam Cha Yisrael, here we are. It's right after Rosh Hashanah. Everybody is worn out. Everyone is tired, especially after Tzayim Gedalia. To come out to a shir really speaks volumes about the, the greatness of a Jew, the greatness of Klal Yisrael. So I want to wish everyone a uh, gotiar, a shana tova, and uh, in the zchus of our coming together tonight, we should all be blessed with a happy, healthy year for us and our families. Ad biyasko el tzadak. Tonight's shir is not for the faint-hearted. Tonight's shir is for those who are brave to really be open to what the process of tshuva challenges us with. I want to start by observing two psukim in Mishnah Torah, two psukim in Devarim, that are almost identical, almost exactly the same, but there is one small discrepancy, one nuance of difference, and this discrepancy will really open up to us what the mitzvah and the opportunity of tshuva challenges us with. In Parshas Re'eh, which is the very first parsha that we read in Chodesh Elul, Parshas Re'eh is always read either on Rosh Chodesh Elul, Shabbos Rosh Chodesh Elul, or the Shabbos right before Elul. So the parsha begins, Re'eh on Oichin Oisein Lefneichem Hayoim Bracha Oklala. See, I have given you today blessing and curse. It's that simple. If you follow the Torah, you observe the commandments, you're dedicated to the laws, you're dedicated to the, the ideals of the Torah, I'm going to give you blessing, I'm going to give you a wonderful life, I'm going to give you success, I'm going to give you happiness. On the other hand, if you don't follow the rules, if you're not committed to the ideals, things will not be good. Here are the stakes. The stakes are very simple. The stakes are bracha and klala. Interestingly, the Shabbos, right before Rosh Hashanah, Parshas Nitzavim, we have almost the exact same Pasuk, almost an identical Pasuk, but with one slight difference, where the Pasuk says, Re'eh nasati lefanecha hayoim. See, I have placed before you today, es hachayim v'yes hatoiv, v'yes hamoves v'yes hara. Life and goodness, death and bad. Now the stakes are not blessing and curse. Now the stakes are not happiness and failure. Now the stakes are not good and bad. Now the stakes have risen much higher. It's much more dramatic difference between the right path and the wrong path. Now it's life and death. What happened? What changed? To the beginning of Chodesh Elul, God says, you do it right, you have bracha. You do it wrong, you have klala. Okay, pretty stark contrast, but it's not life and death. So why in Parshas Nitzavim have the stakes risen so high? So I want to share with you a Gemara, probably the most well-known Gemara in all of uh, the, the, the statements in the Shas and the Talmud Bavli regarding the din and the judgment of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. The Gemara tells us, the Masech Rosh Hashanah, uh, number three on your sheets, Amar of Chris Bedoy, Amar of Yechanan, Shloy Shasfarim Niftachim Rosh Hashanah. Three books are open on Rosh Hashanah. One book of the completely wicked, one of the righteous, and one of the Benonim, the in between, the mediocre, the Benonim. Kacha, kacha, in between. The Gemara states, Tzadikim, Gemurim, Nechtavin, Venechtamim, Laalter, Lechayim. The truly righteous are written and inscribed immediately for life. Rishoim gemurim, the completely wicked, nechtavim v'nechtamim la'alter l'misa. Okay, so far so, so good. Very simple, very clear. Those who are righteous are inscribed immediately for life. Those who are wicked are inscribed immediately for misa, chas v'shalom. What about the Benoniim? Benoniim tluyim v'oimdim. The in-between are suspended. Their judgment is pending. May Rosh Hashanah v'yad Yom Kippur. Zachu nechtavim l'chaim. If they merit, they're written for life. Loi zachu nechtavim l'misa. A few questions here. What is a Benoni? What is someone who is in-between? How do we define a Benoni? Another question we could ask, and this is a question the Ran asks and the Rivet asks, 
we could look around the world, and yes, we see many righteous people living through the year, and we see wicked people not living through the year. But is that always the case? Don't we see sometimes the righteous don't make it through the year? Don't we see sometimes Madua derach Risham Tzalecha, sometimes the wicked prosper? But the Gemara says very emphatically, without unqualified, the Tzadikim make it through and the Rishayim don't. So the Ran deals with this question in a rather creative way. The Ran says a Tzadik is not a righteous person and a Rasha is not a wicked person. A Tzadik is somebody who God decided will make it through the year. A Tzadik is someone who's been acquitted in the judgment. It could be someone who has 1,000 Averos and one mitzvah. And God decided for reasons that are beyond our understanding to give this person a year of life. He is what is called Tzadik Bedin. He's righteous in judgment. On the other hand, a Russia is not necessarily a wicked person, but a Russia could be a Russia Bedin. He may have a thousand mitzvahs and one Avera, and God decided that he's not going to make it through the year. He is what is called a Russia Bedin. And what's a Benoni? A Benoni is someone whose judgment is pending. This way of learning the Gemara, which is the Ran's way of understanding the Gemara, would allow us to sort of make heads or tails on every situation we see. After all, we can never determine who is a tzaddik and who is a rasha. How would we know what, what's in a person's spiritual repertoire? How could we know what's in someone else's heart? So if we see someone who made it through the year, we know God deemed this person a tzaddik bedin. And if a person did not make it through the year, God deemed this person a rasha bedin. Doesn't mean they're a good person or a bad person. That's just the way the, cr- the cookie crumbles. But the Rambam learns the Gemara, what is called Kipshutai, simply. Just like there's a principle in Chumash, Ein Mikra Pshutai, that no verse is ever removed from its simple interpretation, the Rambam interprets this Gemara simply put. Says the Rambam in Hilchas Shuva, Paragimal Halacha Gimel. Take a look at number four. The Rambam says, Ukeshem Sheshoiklin Zuchuyais Adam Vaavainoisav Bishas Misasai. Just like they evaluate and weigh a person's merits and demerits at the time of Misa, Kach B'chol Shana likewise in each and every year, Shoiklin Avoynois Kol Echav Echav Mibayoylam. Each person's mitzvahs and averis are evaluated annually. B'yom Tov Shor Rosh Hashana. Mi Shenim Tzot Tzadik Nechtam L'chaim. If you're found to be righteous, you're sealed for life. The in-between guy, the middle guy, we suspend his judgment until Yom Kippur. Now the Ravid comments on the Rambam that the fact that the Rambam did not qualify the Gemara, but rather he was ma'atik the Gemara, he just copied over the words of the Gemara word for word, that means the Rambam is learning the Gemara kipshutai simply. That a tzaddik is literally someone who has 5,001 mitzvahs and 5,000 averos. He's a tzaddik and he'll live. And a rasha is someone who has 5,001 averos and 5,000 mitzvahs. Now obviously it's not just quantitative, it's also qualitative. And a benani somehow is someone who is exactly equal. So you'll ask... But the way the Rambam interprets the Gemara, how do we make heads or tails? How do we make sense out of many instances? We see righteous people not make it through the year. We see wicked people make it through the year. So my best friend, um, Dr. Grunzeit, asked me, Rabbi Gladstein, we were neighbors for many years, could do me a personal favor, I should speak at Rav Itzla Petterberg at the Shir. So, uh, you know, I can't turn him down. We used to play basketball together in the backyard. So I, I will tonight speak out Rav Itzel Petterberg. Rav Itzel Petterberg is one of my favorite um, Sifrei Moser that discusses the uh, Chachmas HaMoser of the Tshuva process. We know Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Moser movement, he had three primary disciples. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter had the Altar of Kelm, Rav Simcha Zisel, and Rav Naftali Amsterdam, and Rav Itzel Petterberg. And like a good Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter was Moine Shevacham. He would enumerate their praise. So he would say that the altar of Kelm, 
was a chacham, he was a wise person. And Rav Naftali Amsterdam, he would say, was a chassid, was a, a saintly person. And Rav Itzla Petterberg, he would call a lamdin, a sharp analytic mind for learning. In fact, Rav Itzla Petterberg was the, the chief rabbi of St. Petersburg. And he also wrote the response, he wrote Shal Tshuvas pre Tzadik, pre Yitzchak, pre Yitzchak. In fact, there's a very interesting tshuva in the pre Yitzchak. In the first tshuva, you know, the Gemara says, you're walking down the street, and somebody says, oh, you know, I, I, I'm really thirsty. Can I borrow $5? Can I borrow $10? So you want to be a nice guy, you want to hand him $5, $10. The Gemara says that if you lend somebody money without Edim, you're over a lav. You're over a lefnei, you're over a lefnei, because you're going to lend him the money. Then in a week, you're going to say, pay me back. He's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. And you're going to take him to Bezdin, and he's going to swear falsely. So you, you caused him to swear falsely. So the Gemara says, you're not going to lend somebody money without Edim. So what you do is, if somebody needs to borrow money, you should lend him the money. But what you do is, you get two witnesses, or you get one witness, you, you bring over your friend, you say, look, I'm giving, Ru- I'm giving Shimon $10. Or, actually the Chafetz Chaim writes, what you could do is, you tell the guy, just write, he doesn't even have to sign his name, just write, I owe you $10. Write on a little piece of paper. You might, so Ravitzel Petterberg has a chidosh, a, a, a leniency, a kula, that if it's a davar muad, if it's a small amount of money, you could lend the person the money without witnesses because you're not going to take him to court. You're not going to you know, file a lawsuit against the guy for five bucks. As long as it's a small amount that we're now concerned that you're going to take him to court, you could lend him the money without witnesses. In any event, Ravitzla Petterberg hones in on one phrase that the Rambam uses, which is different than the Gemara. Again, going back to the Gemara for a moment. The Gemara is talking about the Benoni. The Gemara is talking about the in-between guy. Let's, let's discuss him for a moment. He has 5,000 mitzvahs and 5,000 averos. And now it's Rosh Hashanah, and he emerged in no man's land. So how is he going to merit a happy, healthy year of life? So the Gemara says, Zachu, if he merits, he'll be, he'll be inscribed for life. And if he doesn't merit, he'll be inscribed Lemisa. Now, what does the Gemara mean if he merits? What, what does it mean if he merits? That could be interpreted to mean, all you need to do is one more mitzvah. So what you could do is, wake up in the morning, you put on a pair of tzitzis, and now you are at 5,001 versus 5,000, and you've tipped the scales. Or you could, if it's Friday, you could light the Friday night candles, you light the Shabbos candles, you've performed the mitzvah da'iraisa, and now you've tipped the scales. All you need to do is one mitzvah. Your friend's uh, got his tire bust, you help him change the tire, so now you've tipped the scales. The Gemara doesn't say how to be zaycha, it just says zachu. So that could simply be interpreted to mean just do one more mitzvah. But comes the Rambam, and the Rambam writes over these words of the Gemara slightly different. Says the, the Rambam about the Benoni. In number four on the bottom line. The Benoni we suspend him until Yom Kippur. If he does tshuva, im also tshuva, nechdam l'chaim. He's sealed for life. V'im lav, nechdam l'misa. And if he doesn't do tshuva, call it a day. The Rambam has a rather novel interpretation of the Gemara. The Gemara says we have a benani, and all you need to do is be zocha. So we could have interpreted that to mean nothing more than just do one more mitzvah. Put on tefillin, why? go run to shul, learn Torah. Each word of Torah is a separate mitzvah. You know, the Vilna Gaon has, a, has an incredible chidosh. Why is it that if somebody's in the middle of learning, they don't interrupt to perform other mitzvahs, unless nobody else could do it? Why do we say the Talmud Torah connected kulam? Why is Torah considered the most prized, most valued mitzvah? And the Vilna Gaon explains, because if you help somebody out, the sum total of the assistance you've given this person is one mitzvah. But when you learn Torah, you go to a shir for five minutes, for one minute, for 30 seconds, each word of Torah is considered an independent mitzvah. So you can't trade in or give up. If 
you, in, one, in one minute you could learn 200 words. So how could you give up a different mitzvah for Talmud Torah? It's not qualitatively or quantitatively on equal footing. So run to Shul, learn Torah for one minute, you've just added another 200 mitzvahs to the Litzad Hazachos, and tilt the scales. But no, that is not how the Rambam interprets the Gemara. The Rambam has a very narrow and specific interpretation of the Gemara. The Rambam learns that if somebody emerges from Rosh Hashanah as a Benoni, as an in-between, as someone who's exactly 50-50, there's only one way to tilt the scales, and that is to do Teshuva. Teshuva is not the only mitzvah in the Torah. There's 613 mitzvahs in the Torah. Do any of them. Why does the Rambam specifically say tshuva? Had it just been for the Gemara, we wouldn't have interpreted it that way. But the Rambam sticks in this interpretation, and the question we have to address is, how does the Rambam know to interpret the Gemara this way? So you know, when they they used to go out to war, in in the olden days, in biblical times, the general would scream out, Anybody here afraid? Anybody scared? If anybody's scared, you know, get out of here, go home. So I'm going to have to give that warning for the rest of this year. This year is not for the scared. It's not for the faint-hearted. Because what we're going to learn is what the challenge of tshuva places upon us. What our responsibility is, especially this time of the year. So let's discuss the following issue. We know tshuva is a great opportunity. We know it's a, a gift. But what if somebody doesn't take advantage of that gift? Is it just a failed opportunity? Is it just a gift that you didn't make good use of? So we know Rabbeinu Yonah, Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the great Rishonim, wrote the classic work on tshuva called Shari Tshuva. Rabbeinu Yonah, in the very beginning of his Sefer, gives the following mushal, the following parable the following depiction of what it's like to have the opportunity to make a change, to improve oneself, to do tshuva, and one decides not to capitalize. So Rabbi Yonah gives the following analogy. Rabbi Yonah says, imagine for a moment you had kat shalistim, a group of robbers, a group of bandits, and they're in prison, they were caught stealing, they were caught robbing. And the prison warden locked them up and he swallowed the key. And a few days later he turns around and they're gone! Nobody's in the prison cell, nobody's there! Except for one guy. And he's just sitting there, he's sitting there in the cell. He's not moving. And there's a hole in the floor. And the warden looks in the hole and the hole goes, you know, out, out the door to the highway. And there used to be ten of them, and now there's one guy inside. What will the reaction of the, of the warden be? What will the reaction of this guard be? So, I don't know. He would go over to the guy and say, You know what? Thank you for be a, being a law-abiding citizen. We really appreciate your respect for the law. Rabbi Yonah says, No, that's not the reaction of the prison warden. The reaction will be, The warden will say, Don't you realize who imprisoned you? The king imprisoned you. You know what the king could do to you. You know what the yechilas of the king is. You know what the ability of the king is. You know what's in store for those who the king imprisons. Everyone else escaped because they were scared of the king. But you're not scared of the king. That's an insult to the king. Now, not only are you liable for the original infraction, but what you're saying is the fact that you insulted the king doesn't bother you, even though you had the chance to correct it and to get out of here and to scram. You said, you're making a statement, I'm not afraid of the king. You've compounded the original infraction. Says Rabbi Yonah, when a person slips, when a person makes a mistake in their observance, we all make mistakes, but you have the ability to correct it. But if you choose not to correct it, then it's like a credit card bill. Then the interest compounds the original charge, and then there are late fees, and then there are penalties. And by the time two months, three months, four months, you owe 
a lot more than you owed in the beginning. So we derive from here a very important principle. That if a person has the opportunity to correct and change something, and they say, you know what? I'm going to wait until... Look, it's only Rosh Hashanah. I'll wait until Yom Kippur. I'll wait until Hanukkah. You know, the Sifrei Hasidus say Hanukkah is the last time to do tshuva. I'll wait until Tu B'Shvat. I once saw in a book that Tu B'Shvat is the last time to do tshuva. I'll wait until Nisan. I hold Benisan Nivra Ha'elam. I'll wait until Shavua Shavuos the Torah was given. I'll wait until Tisha B'Av. I'll wait until next year. I wait until tax season, till all my kids get out of the house, till my great grandchildren have grandchildren. The avera compounds, the infraction compounds. Because the moment the person deviates, the moment the person says, you know what, it's okay, I did something wrong, they're accountable not only for the original infraction, but for failure to make the correct changes. Ravitzel Petterberg highlights this concept. I remember I learned this Gemara in 11th grade. And this is, a, this is a very compelling illustration. So actually, if you look in the book, um, I, I wrote up this particular essay, and they made me take out most of what I'm about to say, because it wasn't really PC. But um, it's a Gemara, so we're not going to be apologetic. This is what the Gemara says. The Gemara makes an observation, and it's, in a way, it's, uh, it's a painful observation, but it's in the Talmud, and this is part of the Tar Shabbat Peh. The Gemara says, in general, Gerim live difficult lives. They have very steep challenges. The Gemara wants to know, Why do Gerim have such hard lives? Again, the Gemara doesn't say in every situation, but the Gemara does make a generality. And the Gemara offers many, many different interpretations, but ultimately the final interpretation of the Gemara is, It's the Gemara in Yavamas, Memches HaMabez, number 9 on your sheet. That the reason why converts sometimes have very difficult challenges in this world is because they did not convert soon enough. They should have converted sooner. They had the opportunity to come to Achaz Kamfei They delayed and because of that they're accountable. That's the Gemara. Let's think about that for a moment. Why would they be held accountable for delaying coming to Achaz Kamfei When a ger comes to the court and says, you know what, I'd like to convert. I'd like to uh, join the Jewish people. So we tell them, for what? What do you need it for? It's too hard, it's too difficult, you have to keep Shabbos, there are penalties. You have to sit in Shul Rosh Hashanah the whole day. You know, and then you go home, and then you do Tashlich, and then the next day you fast the whole day, and then right after that they make you come out to a shir. <laughs> and then, you think Shabbos you caress, the rabbi speaks the whole day on Shabbos. And then you fast right after that. And then you sit outdoors for eight days. And then after that, you go to Shul and you read about how the whole world was destroyed in a flood. So what do you need it for? We scare them off. We say, no thanks. We frighten them. And then they say, no, I really want it. And we dissuade them. And we push them away. And we say, it's not for you. And we say, you could be a righteous Gentile. You could just keep... So why would we punish, why does the Rebbe Hashem hold accountable Gerim for not converting sooner? The answer is when someone has an opportunity, even though he's not obligated to take, it, take up on the opportunity, but if you feel like something is the right thing to do, and ultimately you're going to do it, you need to do it as soon as possible. So if that's what we say to a Ger, who has absolutely no obligation to convert, who we dissuade from converting, we push them away, we, we say it's not a good idea, then a Jew, who has every obligation in the world to have kept the law the first time, and if they don't keep it, they have every obligation to correct their behavior immediately. If they delay doing so, then that's a serious uh, crime. That's something that they're accountable for. 
So failure to take advantage of the opportunity of tshuva is not just a failed opportunity or a gift that you didn't make use of. That's something you're accountable for. If a ger is accountable, then certainly a Jew is accountable. But that's the rest of the year. That's the rest of the year. You know, the Gemara tells us a Masechta Menachais, a Masechta Brachais. You have two people. They both have a mitzvah to wear tzitzis. They both wear the tzitzis. Who will be rewarded more for wearing the tzitzis? The one who exerted more energy to fulfill the mitzvah. So you have one guy, he lives in uh, Flatbush, he lives in Barra Park, he lives next door to the bookstore, he lives next door to the farm store. He could walk next door, buy the pair of tzitzis, put it on and wear it. So he wears it, very nice, but it wasn't really a big deal. You have one guy, he lives in, you know, Kitchen Seek, Idaho. And there are no tzitzis in the entire state. And he has to go online and purchase a pair of tzitzis and it comes to some mailbox a mile away, and then he has to hike to get it. And he wears the tzitzis. Of course, he will be rewarded much more for the tzitzis than the person who was easy for. The Gemara Menachah says, Amar Meir. We know, certainly when the temple stood, there were two strands of tzitzis. You had the white wool and the blue wool. And you had to do both. You had to wear the white strings and the blue strings. Whether that applies today, you'll speak to your local Orthodox rabbi. Rabbi Galler right now is my local Orthodox rabbi, good friend of mine, and it's an uh, honor to be in your Makam Taira and uh, to see you again. And uh, the shul is very fortunate to have Rabbi Galler uh, serving this wonderful kehillah. We used to be neighbors in Queens, and uh, it's really nice to see you again. So you ask your rabbi about the white strings and the blue strings. But let's say somebody, one guy doesn't wear the white strings and one guy doesn't wear the blue strings. Who is more accountable? What is the greater infraction? Not getting the white strings or not getting the blue strings? Not getting the lovan or not getting the treles? So Amar Abmeir, Kasha Onshan Shal Lavan, Yosemi Onshan Shal Treles. It is a much more serious crime not to get the white strings than the blue strings because the white strings are not a big deal. Anyone could get white strings. But the blue strings, you have to catch the chilazan, you have to squeeze out the, the blue stuff, and you have to dye it. It's much more difficult to get a hold of blue strings than white strings. So someone who doesn't get the white strings will be punished more than someone who doesn't get the blue strings. This is a principle in Schar Oinesh. Kasha Oinshan Shalavan Yoyser Me Oinshan Shaltcheles. From here we learn a very important idea. The easier it is to do a mitzvah, the more a person is held accountable for not doing the mitzvah. So Rabbi Sol Salantar teaches that when comes the month of Tishrei, comes Chodesh Elul, comes the Yimei Hadin, what should a person focus on? The most important thing to focus on are those things that are easy to do. Because not doing them is a much greater infraction than not doing the hard things. As difficult as it is to do tshuva throughout the year, there is one time of the year that tshuva becomes much, much easier. Where the Rebbe Shalom makes himself so available to us that if during the rest of the year we may have been lax in doing tshuva, but during a certain time of the year, God comes to us. He makes it so easy for us to do tshuva that there's no excuse anymore. You know, comes the month of Elo. And what, what is the month of Elul? Elul is Ani L'doidi V'doidi Li. God says, look, look pal, you take the first step and I'll reciprocate. So you come close to me and I'll come close to you. And comes Rosh Hashanah, God says, you know, you come to Shul, you do your best and I'll try to come close to you. But we know the Gemara tells us that the Aseris you made Shuvah is a completely different ballgame. Aseris you made Shuvah, it's a completely different story. Because Gemara asked a contradiction. Rami Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish had the following contradiction. One Pasuk says, Kashem Aleikeinu B'chol Karinu Elav. Who is like God who is always available? 
And another verse says, another Pasuk says, Dershu Hashem Bihi Matsai. We just read it by Mincha today. Seek out God when He could be found. So it's a contradiction. Is God always available or is He only available at certain times? And the Gemara answers, Kan biyachid, Kan Bitsibur. When you dive in with a minion, when you're together with a congregation, God is always available. But when you're all by yourself, God is not always available. That's why it's so important to daven with a minion. Because when a person davens himself, their prayer is heavenly, heavily scrutinized. God says, do they deserve it? Are they having kavana? Are they worthy of having their tefillahs answered? When a person davens with a minion, it's almost like a free pass. The Gemara says in Baruch, Hain kabir yamas. God never despises the tefillah of the tzibar. So you could have somebody, his mind is in outer space, his mind is in planet Neptune. He doesn't know where he is, he doesn't know if he's coming or going, he doesn't know if it's a Sersimei Tshuva, or Purim, or Hanukkah. He just knows, he, w- he wound himself up to get in a certain number of sways, clops, falling on his face, and then after about 40 minutes he leaves. But he davened with the minion, it's accepted to some degree. Hain kabir v'layimas. But an individual... An individual's prayer is heavily scrutinized. When it comes to an individual, sometimes God is available and sometimes He's not. So the Gemara asks, when is God available even to an individual? Elu asara yamim shabain Rosh Hashanah liyam akipurim. During the ten days of repentance, God is available even to an individual. When during the rest of the year, God says, who are you? Are you really having kavana? What's in your heart? What's your motive? Is this really good for you? When it comes to the 10 days of repentance, God comes next to you and He makes it easy for you to do tshuva. And certainly when it comes to Yom Kippur, what is the Haftorah we read on Yom Kippur? Va'oymar, soilu soilu, panu derech, harimu michshal, miderech ami. Rav Salavechik, contrasts the attitude of God in the days prior to the 10 days of repentance to what God does on Rosh Hashanah, Aser Simei and Yom Kippur. While in Elul, God says, you take the first step and I will reciprocate. While on Rosh Hashanah, God says, let's do this together. When it comes to Yom Kippur, God says, move out of the way. Clear the path. Clear the road. For who? For me. When it comes to Yom Kippur, Rav Salavechuk explains, it is begeder, it is on the level of koil doidi doifek. God is knocking on your door. God said, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to come to me. I came to you. You don't have to seek me out. I'm seeking you out. All you need to do is open the door. You don't have to open your door, step out of the house, go somewhere to find me. That's the rest of the year. When it comes to Yom Kippur, God beckons at your heart. He says, clear the path, clear the road. I am here coming to you. It is so easy to do tshuva on Yom Kippur. While the rest of the year, if a person doesn't do tshuva, a lot of things we don't do. Sometimes we don't do many mitzvahs. The easiest mitzvah to do the whole year, in a sense, is doing teshuva on Yom Kippur. The Gemara says in Yuma, HaSatan is numerically, numerically equivalent to 364 because the Satan works 364 days a year. He's off the hook. He's fired on Yom Kippur. So you have no evil inclination on Yom Kippur. God is coming to you. You're sitting there in the shul. You're not really inspired. God inspires you. But because it's so easy to do tshuva on Yom Kippur, the onus on us is so heavy. The responsibility is so grave. Because what if we don't do tshuva? Because when you don't do a mitzvah, when it's so easy, the repercussions are very serious. I want to share with you a frightening Gemara. A powerful Gemara. 
an ennobling Gemara, but a very challenging Gemara. Number 17, the Gemara tells us about Reb Zera. Reb Zera had a very interesting practice. Reb Zera's practice was that if somebody insulted him, or bothered him, or aggravated him, he would go to them on Erev Yom Kippur, and he would like, you know, prance around them, walk around them, bump into them, you know, sit in their seat, make himself available to the person so that the person says, Oh, Reb Zera, Reb Zera, oh right, I need to ask Reb, Reb Zera, are you my chami? That was the practice of Reb Zera. The Gemara tells us a story about Rav. By the way, it's an interesting thing. Look it up. Who wrote the Zohar HaKadosh? So most people say, Roshim Bar Yechai. Roshim Bar Yechai didn't write it. He dictated it to his student. Who's his student? Rabbi Abba. Rabbi Abba wrote the Zohar. Who's Rabbi Abba? Rabbi Abba's Rav. When we say Rav, Tana, Hu, Upalig, Rav was the last of the Tanom because he's the student of Roshim Bar Yechai. And he's the first of the Amorim. Rav is also called Rabbi Abba. Bear that in mind for the story. Rav wrote the Zohar. So the Gemara tells us a story. Rav had an issue with a butcher. The butcher insulted Rav. The butcher owed Rav an apology. And the butcher did not come to Rav on Erev Yom Kippur. So Rav said to himself, I'll go to the butcher! So Rav is walking to the butcher's store, to the butcher's house, and he meets Rav Huna, and Rav Huna says, Rav, where are you going? Rav said, I'm going to the butcher. Rav Huna said, no, you're going to murder the butcher. Also, what does that mean? What did Rav Huna mean when he told Rav, you're going to murder the butcher? Rav goes to the butcher. The butcher lifts up his eyes and he says, Rav, get out of here, I have nothing to do with you. Says the Gemara, he was chopping bones, a bone flew up, hit him in the temple and killed the butcher. Asked of Itzla Petterberg in his Sefer Koich a number of questions. Number one, why did Rav and Reb Zera go make themselves available to the people who insulted them to make it easier for them to ask for Mechila? You don't have to do that. It doesn't say that in Shulchan Aruch. In Shulchan Aruch it says that if Ruvain insults Shimon, Ruvain has to go to Shimon's house. That if A insults B, A has to go out of his way to ask Mechila from B. But there's no halacha that B has to go to A's house to make it easier for A to ask for mechila? Where did Rav get this from? Where did Reb Zira get this from? That's, too, that's excessive behavior. I like to say, you know, why do we have Tzom Gedalia after Rosh Hashanah? Because we sit in shul for two days. And you sit there and you pray and you pray with your talis over your head. And all of a sudden you're a big, big tzaddik. But Shlomo HaMelech says, Al Titztak Harbe, don't be such a big tzaddik. You want to be a tzaddik, be a tzaddik. Don't be such a big tzaddik. You know what could happen if you're such a big tzaddik? You could have a guy like Gedalia, where, you sh- where they told Gedalia, Yishma wants to kill you. So Yishma walked into Shul, but Gedalia did not want to suspect that Yishma wanted to kill him. So Gedalia gives him a big hug, and Yishma gave Gedalia a big hug, and then Yishma stabbed Gedalia. Why didn't Gedalia suspect that Yishma wanted to kill him? He was too big of a tzaddik. The danger of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is great, you could sit in Shul all day, but it, you can, don't be such a big tzaddik, you also have to have a little common sense. You know, you could spend 48 hours in Shul, but you also have to balance it with a little bit of Seichel. That's why Tzom Gedalia comes immediately after Rosh Hashanah. So what's Rav and Reb Zira doing? That's too much tzidkos. You're being too righteous. You don't go to the person who offended you. Secondly, isn't it beneath the dignity of Rav and Reb Zera? They're, they're the leaders of the generation. They're the tzaddikim of the generation. Why are they going out of their way to make it easier for the people who offended them to ask for mechila? Where did they get this from? And what did Rav Huna mean when Rav Huna told Rav, you're going to kill the butcher? But the answer is very simple. You know where they learned this from? They learned this from God. They learned this from the Rebbe Nishalem. They were emulating the ways of their Creator. Because if the rest of the year it is our obligation to ask God for Mechila, we summon God, we call God, we say, God, we are ready to change, we are ready to do tshuva, please come to us. We make the initiative. When it comes, Aseres Yimei Tshuva and Yom Kippur, 
God comes down to us and He says, Reb Yid, I'm not waiting for you. And Hashem's, you know, like we say in Ladavid, Lecha Amar Libi Bak Shufanai. God in our heart tells us, Seek me out. The Rebbe Hashem is stirring us. He's awakening us. He's beckoning us. He's coming to us. And He's making it so easy to do tshuva. But the ramifications are frightening. Because when it is so easy to do tshuva, think about what happened when the butcher did not take advantage of the opportunity that Rav gave him. When the butcher said, Rav, get lost, I have nothing to do with you. It is very reasonable to assume that had Rav not gone out of, of his way to make himself available to the butcher, if the butcher never would have come to Rav's house on Erev Yom Tif, probably nothing would have happened to the butcher. It is very reasonable to assume that even if the butcher would have met Rav on the street and he would have said to Rav, eh, I have nothing to do with you, probably he would not have suffered that fate. But now that Rav went to the butcher's house and Rav made it so easy for the butcher and now the butcher's not capitalizing, look what happened to the butcher. Says Rav Itzel HaPetterberg, Ma noira harayon hazeh lamamikba. How awesome is this thought for one who understands the ramifications of it? Because maybe the rest of the year, if we have things that we need to change and improve, yeah, it's hard. We could always push it off. We'll wait to a better day, a different day, another time. It's very hard to change. But during the Aser Simei on a Yom Kippur, on a Neila, there are things that we all know we could improve on. If we don't take advantage of that, we don't want to be analogous to when Rav came to the butcher. Says Rav Itzlapetaburg, this Gemara opened up his eyes to understand the Rambam. The Rambam is talking about a Benoni, he's talking about an in-between person. <coughs> this in-between person, he has 5,000 mitzvahs, 5,000 averos, he's exactly equal. So the question is, so just do one simple mitzvah, put a nickel in the pushka, and now you've tilted the scales. The answer is, you could have done that before Rosh Hashanah. Before Rosh Hashanah, you could have lit your Shabbos candles, you could have baked some challah, you could have done a chesed, you could have got, done a good deed, you could have done anything to tilt the scales. But once you exited Rosh Hashanah as a benoni, and now the opportunity of tshuva is so, so easy. And Rebbe Hashem is coming to us and He's knocking on our door and He's beckoning our heart and it's so much easier to change at any other time and He's giving us the extra siyata d'shmaya. Says Rav Itzla Petterberg, the Rambam holds, no matter how many mitzvahs you do, you could learn day and night for 10 days if you don't repent and you don't do tshuva, that infraction is so severe, it will completely outweigh any mitzvah you may put on the right side of the scale. And therefore the Rambam says, once you're a Benoni, and once you've exited Rosh Hashanah as an in-between kind of guy or girl, there's only one way to tilt the scales. It's tshuva or bust. Rav Meir Simcha of Devinsk, he pictures the scene. We come Yom Kippur night, and like every Yom Tif, we make a bracha, we make a shachiyanu. Thank God that He allowed us to live, and, to, and He sustained us, and He allowed us to reach until this very day. How fortunate we are we have Yom Kippur. How fortunate we are that we have a day that it's much easier to make the changes we need to. But Rav Meir Simcha depicts very frighteningly that if we don't take advantage of the day, then we should not be saying the brach of Shachiyano. Because maybe we're better off not having that opportunity. Because what did Rav Huna tell Rav? Rav Huna told Rav, you're not going to help the butcher do tshuva. You're going to knock off the butcher. You're going to kill the butcher. 
Because Rav Huna knew there was a distinct possibility that the butcher would remain stubborn and he would not take advantage of that opportunity. And therefore we also have to ask ourselves, yes, Yom Kippur is a wondrous opportunity, but a wondrous opportunity if we take advantage of it. But if we don't take advantage of it, then the words that Rav Huna told Rav will be ringing in our ears, we're not going to save the butcher. Says Rav Meir Simcha, a really a remarkable interpretation. In Parshas Re'eh, God has given us many, many mitzvahs. He's already given us 600 or so mitzvahs. And God says there are two paths in life. And if you take the right path, you'll have a good, successful, happy life. Bracha. And if you don't take the correct path, Good things are not in store. But the stakes are not so high yet. Because there's one mitzvah that has not yet been introduced to the Jewish people. And that is the mitzvah of tshuva. And because we don't have the opportunity to do tshuva, the stakes are much lower. Because after all, if you do an Avera, what are you going to do about it? And if you do a mitzvah, okay, you did the mitzvah. So the stakes between right and wrong are dulled. But in the beginning of Parshas Nitzavim, the Pasuk says, Ki ha-mitzvah hazois. Asher anoichi mitzavcha hayoim. This mitzvah that I command you today, lo'i nefles himimcha, it's not removed from you, v'lo'i rechoiko hi, it's not far. Ki karoi ve'lecha ha-davar me'oid. It's very close. B'ficha uv'avavcha la'asoisai. In Parshas Nitzavim, God introduces to us the mitzvah of teshuva. Ah, you could change? You could repent. You could correct. Now the stakes are much higher. Now it's not just blessing and curse anymore. Now it's not just re'e anoichi noisin lefnechem ayoyim bracha uklala. Now it's re'e nosati lefanecha ayoyim es hachayim v'yas hatoiv v'yas hamavas v'yas hara. Now the stakes are much higher. When you have the opportunity to do tshuva, it's a glorious opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's a treasure. It's a gift. It's a matana. It's a chesed. But it's a tremendous challenge to do something about it. I end off with one idea. We have a long way to go. We say, Tshuva is great, it reaches up to the throne of glory. So there's a fantastic gematria for all you gematria lovers out there. That, you know, uh, I just saw there, there were like tens of thousands of Jews in Uman for Rosh Hashanah. There are also many thousands of Jews in West Hempstead for Rosh Hashanah, right? So one thing you could take out of Uman is, you know, they have, they have these bumper stickers, Na, Nach, Nachman, Nachman, Me Uman. So there is a valid system of gematria. I call it the Na, Na, Nachman system of gematria. It actually comes from Rashi in uh, the parashas that we're reading now. Rashi says that when Moshe wrote the Torah, Ba'ar Hetev, what does Rashi say? Hetev, 70 languages. So the Mizrahi asks, how does Rashi know that Hetev means 70 languages? So the Mizrahi says, take the word hey Dave, spell it like this, hey, hey yud, hey yud, tes, hey yud, tes, vez, equals 70. That actually this system of gematria emanates from Rashi. It's a Mizrahi, Rav Leo Mizrahi. Likewise, Rav Sham Shemayat one of the early Mikubalim, he says, take kisei hakavoid, kaf, kaf samach, kaf samach aleph, kaf samach aleph, hey, kaf samach aleph, hey, chaf, and spell out Kisei HaKavah like that, add it up, you get Teshuva. What do we learn from there? That Tshuva is accomplished in small increments. Tshuva is a great opportunity, is a great gift, is a treasure, is a chesed of Hashem. And it's something we have to do. It's something we have to take advantage of. But we don't have to get to the Kisei HaKavah tomorrow. But we have to start the trip. We have to take the first step. We have to look at ourselves. Lev yodea maras nafshenu. We all know where we need to fix and improve. Take one or two or three small things that are easy. Start there. And if we're able to make those small improvements, corrections, tikkunim, 
Then the Chavetz Chaim would say, Teshuvah is like the elevator. And that is, all you need to do is you press the button, you step in, and the Rebbe Hashem lifts you the rest of the way up. So may HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in this chos of us coming together tonight, on the third day of the Aser Simei Tshuva, today is the yard site of my grandmother, blessed memory, Tzina Bas, Rabbi Yehuda Leib, and Hashem Shem Naliyah, in this chos of coming together tonight. May the Rebbe Hashem help us all do Tshuva Shalema, and we should ultimately reach the Kisei HaKavod, Gemar Chasim Thank you. You've just experienced another Torah class, brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.